The results team on education looked at all the research and it says neither one of those things has an impact on student achievement, not at the level you're talking about, particularly with class sizes. So why would we spend our money that way and cut other things we know work? So they recommended to the governor that he recommend to the legislature that they suspend the initiatives, which is possible under Washington law. And to everybody's surprise, the governor went along and the legislature went along. But 20,000 teachers showed up on the state house lawn for a rational discourse about education policy. <laughs> and the union president testified before the budget committees. And it was fascinating because the committee members would say things like, well, we agree, we would like to fund this pay increase. The, the citizens voted for it, so help us out here. You can see the list and the line. What from above that line could we move down so we have room to move your, spend your pay increase up? And by the way, how would that create better results? He wouldn't answer the question. But that's the right question. That's what you want to be talking about at budget time. So it gives elected officials some cover to make the rational decisions rather than the political easy decisions. Only cover, I mean, it doesn't eliminate politics and interest groups and all of that stuff that determines how we spend our money, but it helps. Finally, you get performance accountability. If I'm running a program, I know I have to show results or it might go away. So I'm probably motivated to figure out how to continuously improve my program. I probably start looking for best practices all around the world. And you get this wonderful benefit of common sense communications. You can communicate your budget to anybody, and they get it. So you've lined up your money behind your purposes, and it's clear to everyone, your employees, your citizens, etc. Very powerful tool. Second thing I want to talk about is creating consequences for performance and accountability to customers. You know that one of the big differences between government and the private sector is that typically in government, if you do a great job, nothing good happens to you. And if you do a bad job, nothing bad happens to you. This is interesting. See, you were doing a good job. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Technology gremlins. Let's see if I can. Get this back. I'm not quite sure what happened because it's not supposed to go to sleep. Huh? Maybe this got loose. Huh? It's on the screen. The projector's just not getting a signal there. It's not. Maybe my computer's dying. <laughs> okay, well, I'll do the rest of this without slides. Um, if you do a bad job, in government, nothing bad happens to you. And, and uh, as you can imagine, that doesn't lead to a lot of high performance. So let's think about public education. Um, most of you have been through it, as we saw, so we kind of know what it's like. Our public education system today probably only works for about half of the students. If you think about it, you know, in the big cities, it's worse than that. The dropout rates are over 50%. But statewide, you know, even in the suburbs, the traditional public school, it fits some kids and it doesn't fit other kids. And, and uh, if that's the case, I mean, what an indictment. It works for half of the customers. Um, so what do we know about what works? Well, we know all the research makes it very clear that smaller public schools work. That, for example, middle schools and high schools, the ideal size is 400 to 800 students. And after that, you get declining returns. Um, so a lot of places are taking their big campuses and splitting them up so you have three or four schools on one campus. Um, but not enough places. We also need to know that closer student-teacher relationships are key. That's why size is such a factor, one, one of the reasons. Kids in schools who don't know, really know their teachers and where no adult really knows that kid well, you get lots of problems, some of them as bad as, say, Columbine, Colorado. Um, we also know that we need diverse schools, that kids learn differently, that there are multiple 
kinds of intelligence and learning. And as I said earlier, if you're teaching them all the same, you're being unfair to a lot of them. And I mean, this is, this is particularly true in cities like Cleveland. I've got a good friend in, who uh, has started four charter schools in Detroit. He started with a middle school, then a high school, then two elementary schools. So he's got a little charter district. All inner city African American students, if they were at the public schools, more than half of them would drop out statistically. And he started his school with a promise that 90% who started would graduate and at least 90% of those would go on to higher education of some kind. First morning of the first day of middle school, he had an assembly for all the parents and all the teachers, I mean, and all the students. And the first thing he said to them was, you are all going to college. And then he told them how. The reason was he'd done a year of research and he'd figured out, based on models that work, that the missing element is motivation. Our traditional schools assume the kids come with motivation. And in a place like inner city Detroit, that assumption is wrong. These kids don't know people who went to college. They, they don't think they're going to college. So they get to middle school. Things go along pretty well in elementary school. But they get to middle school, and you start hitting them with abstractions like algebra. And they just check out. Because why the hell should I study algebra? I mean, what's that going to do for my future life? So he convinced them they were going to college. In middle school, they did a lot of field trips to, to workplaces so they could see that world. In high school, they have to spend two days a week in internships at a business or a nonprofit or a government office so that these kids can see people, African Americans, who look like them, wearing suits and ties, having nice cars and nice houses and good jobs, who went to college, and a light bulb will go off. Hey, I could do that too. There is a path for me. He's graduated two classes this year. It'll be his third. They way over the 90% graduation rate. And 100% uh, of the graduates get into some kind of further education. A handful each year have chosen to go to work instead. But well over 90% have gone on to university, college, community college, or technical school. And once that happened, he hired somebody full time whose job it is to get them through four years to graduation of college. Because as we know, dropout rates are very high in college for those kids. Now, that's a very different school. But it's the kind of school you need for those kids. So that's my point. We need very diverse schools. And finally, we need to use technology differently. You know, the US Army 25 years ago figured out how to use technology to train soldiers uh, in a really effective way. And we all know that you know, there's some things. Computers can't do everything for us. Uh, we need good teachers. But there are some things you can learn self-paced on a computer really well. I mean, I, my oldest, my son, the engineer, when he was in sixth grade, he was on the math team. And he, he came home frustrated from these math meets because they had algebra on the questions. And he hadn't had algebra yet. So these were, this was a long time ago. This was in the days when you went to the store to buy software. So I went down to the software store. And I found this program called Algeblaster. It was, called, it was $39.95. I bought it, and I gave it to him. And about three weeks, he learned algebra. Because he's smart, and he's motivated. And you know, it took him about three weeks to learn a year's worth of stuff. And, and that's true of a lot of things. But do we use technology that way in our schools? Not usually. So my question is, if these four things that I've just ticked off, which I, I bet 95% of you agree with. I mean, I picked the easy ones. If we all know these things are true, why don't the public schools do them? Why don't we see more of them? It's so obvious. What's the answer? Because the schools don't have to do it to survive. And there's always adults in the system who will be inconvenienced by these changes. If you did bring computers in in a really big way and make them central, You'd need fewer teachers and more aides. You'd need a different configuration. And that would inconvenience the teachers. 